Luke chapter 5. If you would stand with us one more time, we'll be reading verses 1. Through 11. And I'm reading <coughs> from the King James Version. We do thank God for our viewing audience with us on today, or should I say our viewing church. Amen. Wherever you are and you've joined in uh, with us streaming live, we say God bless you and thank you for joining us in our worship service on today. And we pray that you'll be blessed by the service and the word of God, and then your life will be transformed through the word of God. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished and all that were with him at the draught of the fish which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Amen. You may have your seats. We're ministering today from the subject, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And Bishop has shared his vision with the church and, and with the uh, ministerial staff, and I just want to reiterate that, that our vision is to see people saved, healed, set free, discipled, equipped, empowered, and serving. Amen. And what's key, uh, I believe, in that that vision is the ability to see people before they can you can see them to be saved or healed or set free discipled equipped empowered and serving you have to see them mm -hmm. and not only just see them where they are but vision gives us the ability to see beyond where a person is so not just see them but have a vision to see what they can be keeping in mind what God has already done for us. Amen. Proverbs 3 and uh, verse 30 says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and a wise person captivates people. And I'm, as, as I, I look at the text, and I, I want to go through it and not rush through it, um, it's important for us to, to understand the King James Version says that uh, he that winneth souls is wise. But I like this translation uh, that says that he that uh, basically a wise person captivates people. Talking about what would Jesus do. And I, I, I look at how relatable Jesus is as we prepare to go through um, the text. We many times are so... Um, so over the top, if you will. Uh, we are so religious. We are so boring. Um, that we have forgotten how to captivate people. How to get their attention. And I'm not talking about with gimmicks or gadgets or blessed cabbages. 
and handkerchiefs and, you know, all of these things that make God so mystical. I think, I think what we're seeing uh, in the church today and throughout the body of Christ is that people are finding it hard to relate to God. So we got all of these different tools and all of these different gadgets and gimmicks, and yet people still are not finding God. They're getting bored with these things, and we are finding ourselves in a place where we're looking to be entertained instead of captivated by God himself. But God knows how to capture us and how to capture our attention, how to woo us, as our evangelist said, how to draw us in. After all, he is God and, and just the breath of God on you and the presence of God and God calling your name and his ability to cause you to put down the spoon or or to turn off your your devices or to get off of social media because you hear God and you feel God pulling you. That is God's ability to captivate us. But he is relatable. And to be relatable, it, it means that a person has to know that you can identify with them. And, and Jesus is one that can identify with us. He is relatable. And if we are to see people saved, healed, set free, discipled, equipped, empowered, and serving, we must be relatable. We cannot approach people as if we are better than them or that we have arrived or that we, we are higher or loftier than them. We, we have to be able to present ourselves and to present God and the gospel in a way that doesn't make people feel worse than they already feel. Say amen. He's relatable. As I, as I look at the text, I'm, I'm struck by how much God is concerned about us. He is so concerned about us that the word says, for God so loved the world that he gave. Amen. People that can relate and, and have a love for one another are willing to give. And Jesus God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. That's a sacrifice. And then in the word he says in Leviticus, and I will walk among you and will be your God and ye shall be my people. That is not a God that is aloof. That is not a God that is not approachable. God is totally approachable. We want to set so many boundaries between people and God that you got to come through me and you got to bow down and you got to rub some beads and you got to do all of these things and you got to be in church to reach God. No, God is approachable. Call upon me and I'll answer you. Amen. He does not screen his call. We have not a high priest Amen. that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Amen. I'm concerned that we describe God as being so lofty that he is unattainable. That he is so lofty that he cannot be reached. And we even ourselves in church and been saved so many years still find it difficult to relate to God but God has no problem relating to us he said before you call I'll answer I know your thoughts while you're thinking them I know you're uprising and you're down sitting but yet because we cannot find ourselves in a position where we are relating to God will say, nobody understands me. Nobody can relate to me. But I want you to know that God is approachable. He is relatable. And if we are going to see people saved, healed, set free, discipled, equipped, empowered, and serving, we must present the gospel in a way where we let people know that God is near unto us, for in him we live and move and have our being. Hallelujah. 
Luke takes the time to describe with detail how Jesus interacted with humanity. He paints the picture as, as do Mark and in Luke 4 and Mark describes this scene of Peter's mother uh, being sick with a fever. And, in, and they use the word that Jesus goes over and gently takes her by the hand. But there was the, the, the love that the people had and they knew that Jesus was approachable. They went to Jesus and told him Peter's mother-in-law is sick and he didn't say I'm too busy he didn't say I can't make it he didn't say any of those things he went and he gently touched her on a hand and and raised her up relatable God approachable God he spent time with the people He taught them. He cast out devils. He healed their sick. He took an interest in their lives. They brought the babies to him. They wanted him to bless their babies. They wanted him to make over their children. This is God in the flesh. And what did man do? We don't. He doesn't have time for that. And he rebuked them. Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. For such is the kingdom of heaven. This is the God that we serve. That even as I minister this approachable and relatable God. We have become so consumed with what we do. That what we do is God in itself. And we don't know God. That's not foreign. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. He came unto his own who said that they knew the scriptures but did not recognize him. He said, ye do transgress my commandments with your teachings. Teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. They made things difficult. They made it difficult to get to God. He said, you got the keys to enter and you don't enter yourself and you forbid others to enter. You put weights on the people. You make it difficult. You put a price on the gospel. But this is not the God that I see. He impacted their lives so That when it was time for him to go, they didn't want him to go. But he said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns too. For that is what I was sent to do. He came to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. Good news. Good news. And how did he do it? If we were to read verse 11 first, or alone of Luke chapter 5, and when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. If you are like anything like what I am when I see that scripture, I wonder why, what happened? Why would they want to leave all to follow him? What is it that would make you drop everything and say, for God I'll live and for God I'll die? What did he do? What impact did he make to make them say, we will follow you to close up the business? Amen. Put a just temporary out of business or leave somebody else in charge because I want to follow him. What did he do? What would Jesus do? What did he do? Just want to highlight a few things for you. The first thing that he did is he met them where they were. He preached, secondly, the gospel of the kingdom of God. Thirdly, he met the need. 
And if we have time for these two, fourth, Peter repented. Fifth, Jesus gave an invitation to discipleship. We find in Luke 5, chapter 1, verse 1, I'm sorry, as we focus on point 1, he met them where they were. They were at the lake of Gennesaret, or the lake or the sea of Galilee. This is their place of work. I love the word encountering. It means to show up in our lives unexpectedly. God has a way of showing up in our lives when we least expect him. And as we look and we consider and we ponder what Jesus would do, Jesus would meet people where they were. He met the woman at the well at the time that she normally came to the well, which means that he knew all about her. God knows all about us, and his desire is that we know him. He met the man at the pool of Bethesda, where he was, in his infirmity, yes. not in a perfect state, but in a place of weakness, in a place of despair, in a place of hopelessness, where he was depending on others to do for him what he could not do for himself. And look at that. He waited a long time. <laughs> But Jesus met him where he was. Then Moses, he met Moses on the backside of the desert. Amen. A runaway, a fugitive, not a perfect man, but a man marked by God. A man that God was molding and making. Amen. He met him on the backside of the desert. Where did he meet Jacob? He met Jacob on the run. Amen. On the run after swindling his brother out of his birthright. Amen. What do we see consistent in these scriptures? God will meet you where you are. Broken, messed up, liar, murderer, thief, stealer. God will meet you where you are. We are preaching a gospel that God is looking for perfect people. And that is false. None of us are perfect. Amen. If we were perfect, we would have no need for a savior. So if we're going to see people, we must see people. To see people, we must see ourselves. And remember that we are people. Amen. How we easily forget that we are sinners saved by, by grace. Yes. We ourselves are people. Yes. We must not use terms like them or they. Yes. For God so loved the world. Peter was a fisherman. They had been fishing all night because this was the best time to fish in the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus comes to where they are. His ministry is gaining in momentum and popularity. The people are pressing upon him. They're following him around because he is approachable. And he is relatable. Amen. And he sees two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. They were done with fishing for the day. But here comes Jesus looking for an opportunity to fish himself. He was fishing. Amen. So when we say, what would Jesus do? We look at the master fisherman fish for souls. Amen. So the first thing that he does is he meets us where we are. And he comes to a very common place, a place of familiarity. He comes right to where Peter is working. And he comes at a time where Peter is able to listen. He had been fishing all night. Boats docked washing the nets, and Jesus asked for use of his boat. Automatically, 
Peter's uh, boat becomes a pulpit used for fishing, but now a pulpit to preach the gospel. He comes in a manner for which he first shows Peter in his uh, relatableness that you are valuable to me. I have need of you. You are profitable to me. And if we are to reach souls for Christ, we must regain or, or help people to see the value that is in them. Amen. We're living in a time where people are wondering, what is the value of me, of me or in my life? People are searching, am I profitable? Yeah. Am I valuable? All my life I've been told that I'm less than. All my life I've been told that I would never make it. And I'm out here now because I believed everything that anyone and everyone told me. And then life is hard. Life is difficult. I can't make it. It seems like when I take one step forward, I take two steps back and I'm trying to find value in life. I'm trying to find value in living. I don't see the worth in living. I don't see the worth of waking up in the morning. I don't see the worth in going to work. I don't see the worth in living. But what did Jesus do? He immediately, in spite of the emptiness, in Peter's life at that very moment. Yes. He showed him you are profitable to me. Yes. You are valuable to me. You have something that I can use. Yes. We have to quickly be able to show people their value. I'm always struck with the time that I have. I'm always struck by a visit that I made to a shelter in Brooklyn, New York. And it was a women's shelter. And the women were coming in off the street. They were dirty, filled with despair, hopeless. And I had an opportunity to look one of these hopeless young women in the eye. And I said to her, you are beautiful. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. And the service went on. And in the course of the service, I watched a young woman transform herself just off of those few words from the word of God. I watched her go and not physically, but come down after she had washed herself. I watched her beautify her face and, and, and put on clean clothes. Amen. Because I, just in a few moments, was able to show her that she was valuable. Yeah. Glory to God. Yeah. Hallelujah. All of us today are looking for value. We want to know our worth. But God comes immediately and says, you are valuable to me. You are so valuable that I gave my life for you. You are so valuable that I thought it not robbery to leave my place in glory, wrap myself in flesh, expose myself to whipping and being spit upon and being bruised. That's how valuable you are. Somebody tell the Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Come on, you can do better than that. Hallelujah. Come on and tell him thank you. That will forever be a part of my testimony of the power of the word of God. Just a few minutes of showing someone their value. What would Jesus do? He would meet people where they are. At that time, he began to preach the gospel of the kingdom, the good news. Peter was a captive audience because he was in his boat. Amen. Oh, God knows how to get our attention. God knows how to get in our boat. God knows how to enter our lives through the familiar. God knows how to enter our lives through our everyday activities when we're not even looking for him. 
And what did he do? What did Peter hear? He heard a message of restoration. He heard a message of good news. He heard a message of God's original intent to empower man and entrust him with dominion in the earth under the lordship of a sovereign king. He heard that he was royalty. He heard that give and it shall be given unto you. He heard it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. He heard that they that do thirst and hunger after righteousness shall be filled. He heard blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. He heard blessed are you when men rebuke you revolve revolve against you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake he began to hear of a power of God that I behold I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you he heard that I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly hallelujah he heard the gospel glory to God he heard the good news of Jesus Christ of empowerment of wealth and ability and strength of a relationship with the true and living God that came that we might have fellowship with him that's what he heard So if we are going to have a vision to see people saved, healed, set free, delivered, empowered, and serving, we can only preach Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. What would Jesus do? He met the need. Peter was in a place, fishing was his business. That impacted him economically, to fish all night and not catch anything. So what did God do? He met his need. You don't preach to hungry people. You feed them first. In his fishing for Peter, he first preached the gospel. And then he gave Peter an opportunity to respond. Whenever the gospel is preached, there's always a response to the word. But he shows us and gives us an example that anyone that is going to follow Christ, we must walk by faith and not by sight. He said, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for drawn. Peter's response was, Master, I know you, Lord, and all that, but we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. But this is where a walk with Christ begins. It begins at the nevertheless in spite of my most recent experience of failure, in spite of my most recent recent experience with the church and my disappointment and my letdown and my hurt and my pain, nevertheless, at your word, I will launch out into the deep. I will let down my net. I will try you, Lord. People in life, you are not the only one that's tired. The people that God wants you to see are tired. They feel like they're on a wheel, like a hamster on a wheel. They're toiling. They're not getting anywhere. They're not making any progress. It seems like they're going around and around and around. But nevertheless, I'll do it. I'll do it. And Jesus met the need. He revealed to them his supernatural power. Luke continues to convey a message that with God, nothing shall be impossible. Give God some praise. While you're standing. Hallelujah.
Glory to God. Peter repented. That's what the gospel will do. In the presence of a holy king, what else can you do but repent? If we're just interested in humanity, we will miss the mark. God wants the whole man. We must confess like Peter. In essence, we are sinners. We are sinners in need of a savior. Peter repented. And God said, fear not. I'm going to make you fishers. Amen. So, if we have a vision, and we do, to see people saved, healed, set free, disciple, equipped, empowered, and serving, we must do what Jesus did. As the body of Christ, we must go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. As the body of Christ, we must see people. We have to have vision through the eyes of God to look at a drunkard and see them sober. Like Mary Magdalene to look at a prostitute and see her as a missionary for Jesus Christ. That's vision. Hallelujah.